Thanks to all of the great feedback and comments and everything from Strong Women versus Strong Women that we did a month ago, we are following up with some, with a request that we got a lot. How do you write strong female characters? That is what we are going to tackle in today's video. Hi there, everyone. Lars here from Camille's Harem. Not just a podcast by novice writers for novice writers, but also a YouTube channel by novice writers for novice writers. Because writing is an adventure, it's more fun with friends. And to just hit the nail on the head right off the bat, it's not about writing strong female characters. It's about creating strongly written characters. What we're going to talk about in this video pertains to any character you write, regardless of their gender, sexuality, race, anything. They can be a, ch a sentient chair for crying out loud and they can still be written well or written poorly. But because it was something that was asked quite frequently, how do you write strong female characters? We are going to focus specifically then on some really well-written female characters and what we can use as a template to create our own. And in this video, I will be looking at some examples, Mrs. Brisby, Nami from the live action One Piece uh, feature, Mau Mau from the Apothecary Diaries, and one of my own characters. Yes, I am putting myself here on the chopping block by doing this. I am going to present to you Asuka from Bleed, Steam, and Steel. Now, to break down these four characters, Mrs. Brisby, Nami, Asuka, Mau Mau, I am going to look at them each individually. I'm going to break them down based on personality, their strengths and their weaknesses, the relationships that they have, what is their goal within the story, and as a result of the plot and them striving to obtain their goal, how do they change as characters from the beginning to the end? And I feel like it's really important for me to point this out, that when we're talking about character growth, I am not referring in any kind of way to power-ups. Power-ups are a cheap replacement, a cheap knockoff of true character development. Characters develop by discovering things about themselves, learning more about the world around them, establishing good relationships with other characters, obtaining their goal, or maybe learning that their goal was not worth obtaining all along. They learn, they grow, they apply what they learn, and they become a new individual along the way. That doesn't mean that their core personality necessarily changes, and in fact, we usually don't want to see that. But rather instead, we get to see the heroine that the woman is is by the end of their journey. If we don't see that, if we can't see that clearly, it will never feel as though this was a strongly written character, no matter what kinds of adventures she goes on, and no matter how many great girl boss moments she's given along the way. So let's start talking about personalities. You really want to know your female character before you start selling down and writing out her adventure. Is she funny? Is she serious? Is she sad? Is she happy? Is she someone who's unsure of herself? Is she scared of the world? Is she someone who's not trusting or overly trusting? You can have so much fun creating all different kinds of bits of personality. And I'll say this right off the bat, angstiness is not a personality. Get that on out of here. Angstiness can be a part of someone's personality, but if your character's personality is angst, that is not a character, that is a trope. So to help illustrate this, let's have a look at our four women right here. Starting off with Mrs. Brisby from The Secret of Nim. Mrs. Brisby is a soft-spoken, easily scared, unsure of herself, yet very loving, caring woman. That is her core personality. And as we will see throughout the story, she gains certain kinds of strengths. She becomes more knowledgeable. She's definitely someone who is willing to admit when she doesn't know something or when she's not very good at something. That's another core part of her personality. She is incredibly honest, almost to a fault, and yet not exactly to a fault because she does have some guile to her. She also has some amazing moments of wit and sarcasm, especially when she's dealing with Jeremy the Crow. If she can't stand someone, you get a little bit of spiciness, a little bit of sarcasm coming out of Mrs. Brisby right here. So even though she is shy, easily scared, and overly loving, that doesn't mean that there isn't nuance to her character. In fact, the more that you watch of Mrs. Brisby, the more you realize that there's a whole lot more to this woman. Very incredible woman. No wonder Jonathan, the hero of the Rats of Nim, fell for her. 
Then let's have a look here at Nami. Nami is a fascinating character, and I apologize to all of you One Piece fans out there who are going to be like, you need to know more about her through the manga, through the anime. I'm getting there with Nami. I'll get there eventually. But looking at what we can see in the Netflix live, uh, live action adaptation, well, this is what we can observe of Nami. Yes, she is a very blunt individual and not necessarily prone to being overly happy. And we can see that part of that is most definitely her history, given what's happened to her family, to her town, how she's been used and abused. So that, that all makes sense right there. But more so than that, she is a very inquisitive individual. She is very observant as well. And she can be cold and calculating, and yet she is also very caring. And that comes about because this is part of who she wants to be. You can have contradicting aspects within your character. Human beings are just like that. We are contradictory individuals, and it's a constant struggle between our virtues and vices. So you can have someone like Nami who is caring, but also can be cold and calculating. And we get to see that sorted out depending on how Nami feels about the people that she's working with. She's totally fine with abusing the Marines, yet the more that she gets to know Luffy and the rest of the crew, she is more apt and more prone to looking out for their best interests, giving them advice even if they're not going to listen to it, and lending support where she can. We also see that Nami is incredibly resilient, and that is a very important aspect of her character and what leads her through the opening arc or the opening season of One Piece. Then let's have a look at the personality for Mau Mau from the Apothecary Diaries. Mau Mau is an incredibly endearing character because of her bluntness, her silliness, or just her no-nonsense way of viewing the world. It's also a point where you could actually think that she's a little bit cold of a character, and yet she loves what she loves, and she loves poisons. She goes over the moon for that stuff. And you realize that Mau Mau is actually a very emotional character where she feels comfortable or where she feels like she can be open and that is incredibly fun and nuanced that she can be reserved calculating a little bit cool a little bit standoffish within certain situations and in others she just completely opens up this is kind of how you would expect to write like a good introvert or someone who's a little bit neurodivergent right here she is also incredibly caring for the people that she comes to know and she also cares about other people. This has been ingrained into her by her father, who is an apothecary, and who has taught her to be observant, to be caring, to be forward-thinking, and she is striving to develop those attributes as an apothecary and as just a good woman overall. And also as part of her personality, she is prone to overanalyzing and overthinking just about anything. She can be incredibly dense also at the same time. And that's funny to see for a character who's so observant, who's so forward thinking, who can elaborate on just the smallest bit of detail. If there's something that she doesn't understand, she can be totally dense about it. And that is really fun to see mixed in with her coolness and with her openness also thrown into the mix. It makes Mau Mau very bombastic. Not spunky, but bombastic. Finally, we get to my character, Asuka, from Bleed, Steam, and Steel. Her personality is one of honor, a little bit of uptightness around other people, but when she's around people that she knows, people within the military society that she's a part of, or her own family, she completely loosens up and tries to crack jokes. She's not necessarily the funniest of characters. Her sense of humor could use a little bit of working, but that doesn't mean that she doesn't like laughing, that she doesn't like having fun fun. She is an incredibly adventurous spirit, and she's someone who longs for the days of combat that her parents and grandparents had. She lives in a time of peace, and she wants adventure. She wants battle, and that dominates a lot of who she is. She is also incredibly tied to honor and her family. She loves her family. She loves her close friends. She will do anything for them. She'll do anything to preserve her family's honor in a very horrible situation. So she is then also a very self-sacrificing character on top of all of that. And because she is really tall and really muscular for her uh, particular ethnicity, people might think that she's a bit of a meathead, but 
she really isn't. She is more of a caring individual. And even though she spends a lot of time with engineers working on her massive mech suit, she is interested in technology, but she's not a master of it. She's not a true engineer. And so while she might be very adventurous and sometimes inquisitive, you begin to get a grasp of she knows what she knows. And what she knows, she knows very well. But she's not necessarily a great intellectual. And that's important to get in terms of personality because your intelligence, your humility, your pride, your lack of intelligence, all of that also kind of acts as a filter for the core uh, personality traits of happy, sad, angry, suspicious, and so forth. And to wrap up talking about character personalities this is where I think a lot of people actually get lost in the weeds and you really shouldn't you should try to avoid this as much as possible when it comes to understanding your character's personalities it is good to have like little blurps of history explaining why your character is that way how were they raised what was a good experience with a friend or what was a horrible experience with an enemy or with someone else that helped to define and mold their personality as it is when the readers are introduced to them. You do not need to go very deep into this. You can if you wish, but I've seen this happen with a lot of authors that if they try to dig too deep into that, it sidetracks them completely from where they should be taking their characters with their main plot. Those little backstories just help you as the author create a far more realistic and relatable individual. Now, let's jump on over to strengths and weaknesses. And this might seem a little bit easy to just kind of rattle off right here, but it is important to make sure that your characters have multiple strengths and multiple weaknesses. And it's also important, I think, to point out that some of those weaknesses don't have to be or should not be overcome within your story. Why? Because it actually makes the character far more interesting when they have to struggle. So let's have a look here with Mrs. Brisby. First off, what are her strengths? Her strengths are that she is incredibly caring. That is indeed a strength that propels her to do all these incredible things throughout the story. She is also a good listener, as opposed to her children. She will listen to what other people have to say, which helps her to piece things together really quickly. And I will also put this in here as a strength, even though she's not very good at it, she knows how to read. And this helps to open up her world to more possibilities and to better understand the rats of Nim. But her weaknesses on the other hand are she is physically weak she is small compared to the tractor she cannot defeat the tractor on her own and she can't complete all of these big quests on her own either she has to develop strong relationships with good allies in order to have them give her the advice or the or the physical help that she needs in order to save her family and her size and her strength are things that she can never fully overcome and so it requires other things to help her over to help her overcome those weaknesses most importantly being her love for her family which empowers the magical stone that her husband left for her then when we look at Nami, what are her strengths? Well, she is a pretty good fighter, and even though she might not be as strong as some of the other people on the crew, that's okay, so long as she can hold her own, which she absolutely does. She also has an absolutely brilliant mind for doing maps. She can look at stuff, she can memorize things really, really quickly. She has a strong intellect. That is a very good strength to have. She also has, and I said this is part of her personality, and this is indeed a strength, her resilience. She's able to hold out against just about anything. It takes pre pretty much the ordered execution of the village, of her, of Coco Village, to drive her to despair. And if it hadn't been for that, she probably would have still kept on doing what she was doing because that is her resilience. Now, as far as weaknesses go for Nami, within One Piece, the biggest weakness to Nami is her distrust of other people. She feels like she can't trust others because of her experiences. Everyone's going to lie to you, everyone's going to disappoint you, and everyone's always looking out for themselves. And she's even misconstrued that as, what I'm doing for Coco Village, I am doing it for my own selfish reasons. Even though I love these people, I am just being selfish, and I hope that one day they will understand, but I know that they hate me because I've been... In, uh, helping out Arlong all this time. 
And so that mistrust, which then even kind of devolves in, or yeah, it devolves into a sense of self depreciation and depression. Yeah, that is a massive weakness for her, which can only be overcome by Luffy's faith and trust in her her. She is a person who doesn't have very strong loyalties. That is a weakness. And what we see at the end of season one for One Piece is that those weaknesses are faced head on by her and the rest of the crew. And she's able to overcome those at least within this particular situation of saving Coco Village and freeing the people that she knew when she was a girl. We then come to Mau Mau. Mau Mau has absolutely an amazing intellect. This is obviously one of her greatest strengths. Her wit is also another great strength, which endears her to a lot of the women within the rear palace and attracts the eye of Jinshi. Any woman can be intelligent, but combining wit and intelligence? Oh boy, no wonder this guy is falling head over heels for her. And another strength that she has is her resourcefulness. And a great example of this is the painting of freckles upon her face. She knows that if she makes herself look quote unquote ugly, that there's less, uh, there's less likely a chance that men in the red light district would attack her. So by painting on those freckles, by making herself ugly, being resourceful, she's able to protect herself. And she definitely leans into that more homely look. Though a strength that she does have, which she doesn't like utilizing, is her innate sex appeal. And that's a very interesting thing to see right there, when a character has an obvious strength being her actual good looks, but that they refuse to use them because she sees that as a weakness. And in turn, that actually does create a weakness because she could be a very much more influential character, a way more charismatic individual, just surely using her beauty, but she doesn't use it, and it's because she herself undervalues it. That's a very interesting point right there with Mau Mau. And as far as weaknesses go, she is physically weak, and that's something that 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 means that she again has to rely on her inner on her intellect. But in any situation where action is required, she is immediately set back, and she needs to rely on allies to help her out. Another weakness, which is very important to understand with Mau Mau, is that she doesn't, even though she's very intelligent, she doesn't immediately read the room or read people very well, which causes all kinds of miscommunication and can lead to some real problems down the road. And as far as some weaknesses that she has that she cannot overcome no matter what she does, weakness number one, she's allergic to stuff. You can't just simply beat allergies especially at that time, day and age without any kinds of medicine. So that is a weakness that if anyone should exploit, she's in trouble. Second big weakness is this. She is a woman within the Imperial Palace. While women can hold positions of power within the Imperial Palace, that is no guarantee of freedom or autonomy. It is no guarantee of safety. And Mau Mau, even though we see her becoming more of a power player within the schemes of the palace, that does not mean that she is not subject to laws, tradition, and the whims of far more powerful people. This is a weakness that she can't simply overcome. It's a weakness that she might not ever overcome because of the way that the society is structured in which she lives. Then we come to my character, Asuka. Her strengths are very obviously, she is incredibly physically fit. She is able to use these massive mech suits called paladins, which require a lot of raw strength in order to use them. Think kind of like driving a car without any sort of steering fluid. It's really difficult. You got to put your back into it. That's what it's like using these massive mech suits. You have to be physically fit in order to use them, to even use the hands because it's requiring your own hand strength. So she's a very strong girl. She's also very knowledgeable in how to duel other people. She uses that strength throughout the story to gain leverage and support for her family, which is really great. So she's strong. She's a very capable warrior. And another strength is how fiercely loyal she is to the people that she loves. However, some of the weaknesses that she has is she is she is just woefully ignorant of how the Imperial Court works, which is a very bad thing for her later on in the story. Also, her desire to basically self-sacrifice, for instance, for the people that she loves puts her into situations that she shouldn't be in. Situations that get her into a lot of trouble. And she is also very prideful. Because she is so strong, because she 
is so good at dueling, she really hasn't been beaten very often, and so she's very sure that she can gamble her family's life in this make it or break it, winner takes all stakes for duels and the likes in order to save her family from utter destitution and dishonor. That pride, however, her pride in herself leads to some massive mistakes later on within the story, and that is something that she will have to reconcile. Next, we come to relationships. When we look at Mrs. Brisby right here, she has all kinds of very important relationships. She has the relationships with her children, who she's trying to save. She has a very good relationship with Auntie Shrew, who comes to save her and her family when she needs it the most. The relationship that she forges with Jeremy the Crow becomes very advantageous for her when she needs help. However, it does come to bite her a little bit in the rear, because Jeremy is an incredibly annoying character. The relationship that she has with her deceased husband, Jonathan, endears her to some very powerful individuals such as the Great Owl, who directs her to go and meet with the rats from Nim. There she's able to develop a good relationship with Justin, the captain of the guard, as well as with Nicodemus. And she has a good relationship with their friend, Mr. Ages, who also turns out to be an escapee from Nim. These are all very positive relationships that help her in her quest to save her family. However, a negative relationship that she has is with Jenner, the man who is planning, or I should say the rat, who is planning to overthrow Nicodemus and kill keep the rats of Nim at the barn or at the farm in order to continue to feed off of the energy and products that the farmer has. And that negative relationship is what leads to Jenner using Mrs. Brisby to kill Nicodemus as well as to try to kill Justin and take over the entire colony. And that leads to really the climax of the movie right there is that negative relationship and the way that Jenner is able to exploit it. When we look at Nami, Nami's a fascinating character because of the relationships that she has. A lot of the relationships are fairly shallow from at least what we are able to see throughout the series. And she has relationships with all different kinds of characters. And no, I'm not talking the romantic kind. I'm talking about connections to individuals, such as with Arlong and his gang. This is, again, a very negative relationship, which has corrupted a lot of Nami's view of the world and of people. If she had had far more positive relationships, relationships in her life when she was younger, we could see that Nami would have ended up being a very different character, but these relationships have come to define her. Her positive relationship with Luffy, even though she presses back against it a whole lot throughout the series, leads her as well to finally discovering more about herself and rediscovering hope and true friendship. And the relationships that she has with the other crew members are kind of annoying to her throughout, like it's like, oh, you guys are so stupid, why do you do what you do? But these relationships are important in helping her to open up and see the goodness in other people and to realize that the dreams of others are worth it just the way as Luffy sees them if you have a dream and you're willing to aim for it that is what you should do and so these relationships the positive relationships that she has later on are very important to her character development in overcoming all of the poison that Arlong has injected into her life and her way of thinking when we get around to Mau 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 has tons of of relationships with all of these different characters throughout the Rear Palace and throughout the Red Light District. She has very sisterly relationships with the courtesans. She has, of course, the father-daughter relationship with her father, who turns out to be her adoptive father. She also has kind of a granddaughter to grandmother relationship with uh, the lady of the house for the house of Verdigris, if that's how you pronounce it. I'm very sorry if I mispronounced that name. Please forgive me. She also has a lot of great relationships with the concubines of the rear palace, some of which are very friendly, others are a little bit more standoffish to a certain regard. A lot of the relationships that Mau Mau uh, is able to found with these women and with other people are largely based on kind of, at least I should say based in first, in kind of a quid pro quo. I will do something for you, you will do something for me, and as people get to know who she really is deep down, people open up and become far more friendly towards her. Then, of course, there's the very volatile relationship that she has with Jinji, which is absolutely delightful because of how she mistrusts him and misreads him a whole lot of the time and how he acts like such a fool around her. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's probably the most colorful relationship within the entire series. But one of the things that really marks Mau Mau's relationships with most of the cast as the story progresses is how they come to trust each other. And it's beautiful to see how a lot of the concubines especially really come to trust Mau Mau and they open up to her, how they will protect her, how they love her. And that is because she is genuinely good to them within her relationships. Mau Mau reads opportunities through which she can manipulate people. Her great intellect even points her to that. But what's great about Mau Mau's personality is because she is genuinely a caring and good person, she is able to create largely very positive relationships with all these people within the Imperial Palace. And returning to Bleed, Steam, and Steel, one of the things that I absolutely loved doing with Asuka was writing the relationships that she had with various characters. For instance, with her brother Makoto. It's a very jokey relationship where she lords it over him to various degrees that she is the older sibling, therefore she is the one who should be obeyed according to their customs, and she tends to not listen to him very well, which really aggravates him, but she still genuinely deep down loves her brother, and when push comes to shove, she is willing to go to him for help where she is deficient and can't make things happen. She also greatly loves her mother and her younger sister, even though we don't get to see a whole lot of that within the book. And the time that she is able to spend with them, we see that there is a lot of closeness there. They really do love each other. Again, Asuka's willing to do anything and everything to help out her family. But one of the big things about Asuka's journey is how she faces off against many of her old rivals from back when she was a young girl. She's dueling her way through all these people who don't like her, yes, to get money and prestige, which is going to help out her family who are on the verge of uh, destitution. However, along this journey, she makes friends with a, lot, with a lot of these rivals, or at least manages to form a good standoffish relationship, where it's like where they realize we're never going to like each other, but we can respect each other. So it's this journey of friendship and respect for Asuka. She duels her way through her rivals and begins to realize that, you know what, maybe even I wasn't the best person a lot of the times, which is a good humbling moment for Asuka. And that's a good thing to have with any relationship. When a relationship can push back on the main female character and show her how she can and should and even needs to improve as the story progresses. Relationships aren't just there to kind of be had and add fun and fluff. Relationships, relationships are there to help a character improve, to learn more about themselves and the world around them them. But of course, Asuka also has various villains in her life as well. And I'm not going to exactly spoil that bit right there, but let's just say that a couple of the villains whom, with whom she has relationships with, they are very despicable people right there. And it's in many ways because she has those relationships, because she has those people in her life, that she opens herself up to some horrible things that happen later on within the story. Now then, I know that this video has already gone on pretty long, but honestly, I like taking this time to look at each individual character. In many ways, I'm just scratching the surface on each one of them. We can do way deeper dives into these characters, and if that's something that you would like to do, then please let me know in the comments, and we can even do a live stream where we can interact with each other and we really go deep into some of these female characters, these female leads, and see what makes them so well written. But moving on, let's talk about the goals. This is pretty easy right here. This is one of the most straightforward things for any sort of character that you write, but it is essential that you have this. What is the goal that your female character has at the beginning of the story? This may change, this may even be fulfilled very early on, but your character still needs a goal to strive for as the plot progresses in order to challenge them to continue growing and interacting with other characters as the story progresses. So when we look at Mrs. Brisby, her goal is very straightforward. Save her family. How she should save her her family changes actually throughout the story, giving her new goals along the way, but that's her core goal, save her family. When we look at Nami, her core goal is to save the people that she loves, to complete her deal with Arlong and save her hometown. That is her core goal. That does change, and it changes drastically by the end of the season, but that's the goal that defines her and how she interacts with people as she goes throughout the story. When we look at Mau Mau, Mau Mau's a very interesting character because it seems as though at first she's just trying to survive in the rear palace. All of these 
problems, these mysteries are thrown her way and she solves them. What we come to realize and what Mao Mao for herself actually has to realize as the story progresses is that that's not enough. She is being controlled and manipulated and pushed around by all these other people, even unintentionally. She's being pushed around by the forces of the society that in which she has been imprisoned. And so for Mao Mao, what becomes her goal is freedom, true power through autonomy. The ability to say for herself, this is who I am, this is what I like to do, and I have the ability to do that to explore that and to protect and be with the people that I care about. And it's neat seeing her develop that goal throughout the progression of the series. And when it comes to Asuka from Bleed, Steam, and Steel, her core goal is to save her family from destitution. Her father unfortunately passed away pretty early on due to an illness, but before he did, he committed his wife who was dying from a very horrible atrophy of the muscles caused by an illness that they can't, that they can't cure. He committed her to the emperor's care, which costs a lot of money, and the family is expected to cough up major coin in order for the emperor to continue caring for her. Should Asuka refuse to pay that coin and, and her mom is returned to her, it will mean an even swifter death for her mother, whom she loves, and it would be seen as dishonorable. However, if she has to sell off her lands or sell off her mech suit in order to help her mother, that would also be seen as dishonorable because she is unable then to truly provide for her family, which is what leads her to challenge all of her rivals to high-stakes duels. So that is her goal protect her family from dishonor and destitution by engaging in these high stake duels. That goal does change a little bit towards the end of the book, but I'm not going to spoil that here because it is a pretty fun twist which then ties into all the other POVs that you get throughout the book. And finally, we get to how should a character grow as a result of their adventures, as a result of reaching out to grasp their goal, to have victory. If your character isn't growing, if your female character isn't growing as the story progresses, she is just simply in there for diversity's sake, to be there, to be nice and pretty, or for whatever other reason, and she becomes boring. One of the biggest fallacies, one of the biggest problems of modern Hollywood is this message of you were always good enough. That is actually a very positive message to have in real life, but if you don't strive to improve and to become a better person, you will actually retrograde over time. So, it's great that the power was always within you, but let's see where you can go from there. We want to see our female leads grow as individuals to become even greater heroines than they themselves thought they could be. So starting off with Mrs. Brisby, how does she change as a person throughout her her journeys. She doesn't become any stronger or smarter or anything like that. And in fact, a lot of the people with whom she has got good relationships with leave for Thorn Valley. So it seems as though she loses quite a bit, but she does save her family. And one of the things that she's able to prove to herself is her own inner strength, that even if she's not physically strong, she, her love can overcome all obstacles. And she inspires other people. She inspires herself. And on top of that, I think that it's very arguable as well that she is able to come finally to terms with the loss of her husband, and she's able to finally move on from that tragic death that he experiences by getting eaten by the farmer's cat. And as a result, when you get to that last scene of The Secret of Nim, it's such a beautiful moment because, because finally Mrs. Brisby just has that moment where she can be there with her family, finally relax, and she is calm. She is at peace with where she is, and she has no more fears for the future. And it's just so well-deserved. She might not make massive leaps or bounds with who she is as a character, rather Rather, this is truly a story of self-discovery and improving a little bit along the way, but it is a significant improvement nonetheless. When we look at Nami at the end of the live-action One Piece, uh, series, or at least of the first season for it. What we see of Nami is that she's very much the same individual that she once was, except now she has saved her childhood home. And she now has people with whom she can be real friends with. She is finally learning to trust, which was a huge, huge obstacle for her. 
So even though it's only really one weakness that she overcomes, it is a massive obstacle to her personal progression, and she's finally able to hurdle over it and become the woman and the pirate that she needs to be. And when we look at Mau Mau, Mau Mau is still in the middle of her journey, both in the anime and in the manga. However, we see her striving to obtain that greater autonomy within the Rear Palace and then later on within the Imperial Palace, and we see her making definite progress towards that end. Mau Mau truly becomes a power player within the schemes and the politics of the Imperial Court, but still, because her story is unfolding, there's all kinds of adventures and hurdles yet in her life way. She hasn't yet obtained that end. But by striving to do that, she has begun to bridge the worlds of the Red Light District with the Imperial Palace. She has helped to save some very important characters and uncover some very important mysteries as well, which have allowed people to kind of come to peace with certain things that have happened to move on or to find greater power and autonomy for themselves within a rather oppressive system. And then for Asuka, while this might be a bit of a spoiler for my own book right here, yes, she does save her family. I'm not going to say how she saves her family, though. That's something that you're going to have to read. But her saving her family does do a couple of things for her character. Number one, it teaches her that she needs to be a little bit more humble, which is a very important thing to, to see in any sort of prideful character. Humility is a true virtue and a true strength. Also, for someone who wanted the glory of battle, the action of battle that her parents and grandparents had, well, she finally gets a taste of it through her own duels and some of the consequences that come from said duels. She begins to realize peace is way more more enviable than action and glory, which is a huge thing for her to realize and to process, and it comes at a bit of a cost as well. But as a result still of that journey, Asuka grows as a character. She doesn't get any stronger or any better as a fighter, but rather instead, she comes to a greater understanding of the world and her place within it and her position with her family. And that is at least I hope. I hope it comes across beautifully, and I also hope it comes across bittersweet when it's supposed to towards the end. And so I highly recommend, if you want a very interesting story with a physically strong female lead, and how I decided to write her, then definitely read Bleed, Steam, and Steel. And in fact, I kind of in a way fashioned Asuka uh, the way that I did, not just because I love muscle women right here. I don't, because <laughs> I love women who could fold me over and tie me into knots. <clears throat> Never mind that. I actually wanted to kind of take a little bit of a jab at Hollywood and be all like, so you guys think that just simply writing a physically imposing female character makes her a better individual? While I do like muscle mamas, that doesn't necessarily mean she's a better person. Instead, it is through an exploration of character, the relationships that she has and the journey that she goes through that makes her a well-written and engaging, relatable, and ultimately a strong character. That is what I strived to do with Asuka in Bleed, Steam, and Steel. And so if you haven't read it, I hope that you do check out the book and let me know if I succeeded. If I didn't, I would love to hear your feedback so that way I can become a better author in the process. So, whew, to wrap up this very long video right here, what do you need to write a strong female character? Well, starting off with personality, strengths and weaknesses, relationships, what her goal is, and how she's supposed to grow and change as an individual through her adventure, throughout the adventure of the plot, those five things already give you quite a bit to work with. Now then, we can definitely dive in deeper, and there are certainly other elements as well to crafting any well-written character. But if you're wondering how I should write a good woman, here's the thing, don't become too obsessed with the fact that this character is a woman. Instead, as we've seen right here through all of this, you want to have a look at the personality that she has, her relationships, her history, her goals, her strengths and weaknesses, all of these things make her interesting and relatable, like any real person. Just one aspect of an individual is not the only thing that defines them. I, I told my students this a whole lot when I was teaching. In order to understand an individual, we have to think of them like a diamond. Every aspect of them is a different facet of that diamond. If I were to hold up a diamond and say, this diamond is perfect and beautiful because of this one singular facet, I would look like an 
idiot. Especially if the rest of that diamond's absolutely ugly and uncut and unpolished. And it's the same with a character. If you hold up this character and say, this character is amazing because she is a woman, well, that's, again, like saying that one diamond is beautiful because of one facet of that diamond. That diamond, as a whole, has so much more to offer. And if it's an uncut, unpolished diamond, it's even more fun because then you can actually then say, we can start crafting and changing the stone into a beautiful gem that has all these amazing qualities to it. I've seen this happen way too often with novice authors where they take, especially a female character, and only give her like two or three things to make her interesting, to make her an individual. And no, that's again like looking at a diamond saying because of these two, three facets, it's a beautiful gem. It is not. It's a beautiful gem because of all of its components coming together in a beautiful, shining way. We need to see people and we need to see our characters as far more complex. Yes, that does mean more writing on your part, but you will be rewarded with far more engaging, far more interesting, far more actionable characters that you will love writing every single day for. And so let this, let this right here be a template through which you can begin. So now at the very end, as of my conclusion of this, if you would like to have a deeper dive into these characters, let me know in the comments because we will most definitely do a live stream if that's what it takes to engage with you guys to have deeper discussions about these characters. Also, if you enjoyed the way that this went, even though it was kind of a long video right here, if you enjoyed the way that I broke down these characters, then let me know if there's other characters that you would like me to break down and see what makes them well-written characters. And it doesn't just have to be women, but because a lot of people do have questions about how to write strongly written women, just let me know and we can make more of these videos. <laughs> even though it takes quite a bit of work, it is fun, it is so rewarding to do this right here so please let me know in the comments below i want to i want your feedback i want your insights i want your suggestions that is what we crave here at camille's harem and if you'd like to support the work that we do again please check out bleed steam and steel i would absolutely love it if you bought it a copy if you read it and if you gave me your honest feedback on it i so want to hear what other people think about my writing because that will help me also improve as an author and i hope that you really really do enjoy this book because according to everyone else's in the harem this is their favorite book of mine that they have read so i will definitely boop, 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 toot my own horn on that right here but otherwise thank you so much for joining us on this deep dive into these characters and how to write uh, well-written characters especially well-written women which we definitely need more of and until the next video y'all choose